Hello, everyone. It is Saturday, the 14th of November, three days before the publication of a really marvelous, almost miraculous, in fact, novel, because some of the contributors are no longer with us. Um, it's called How Done It. It is a project of the Detection Club, which I think, and Martin Edwards, the current president who will be running this meeting, can correct me, is the longest running social club, if not professional club, for crime writers certainly in the United Kingdom. His past presidents have included such luminaries as Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, um, H.R.F. Keating, Simon Brett, and currently Martin Edwards. Um, it's a wonderful group. I've been privileged to attend some of its meetings as a guest. In fact, Martin, I was there when Simon Brett was sworn in. Oh, wow. the, as the president. So, you know, that was at the Savoy, the famous night I wound up sitting in the ladies' room with P.D. James for 15 minutes because she didn't want to go back. <laughs> Always, it's my most intimate conversation with P.D. James all the way around. Um, in any case, they have produced this wonderful book called How Done It, which publishes on Tuesday here in the United States from HarperCollins. And I urge anyone who is an aspiring writer, a published writer, or a reader who is interested in the writing process to acquire a copy because the essays from the members are really spectacular. And Martin is not only president of the Detection Club, but is the editor of this wonderful project. So I'm now going to hand off this conversation to him. Thank you, Martin. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Barbara, and thanks very much for, uh, for hosting this uh, discussion. I'm delighted to say that I'm uh, joined today by three of my wonderful colleagues in the Detection Club. Uh, Ellie Griffiths, uh, Andrew Taylor, and Aline Templeton, and they will be having plenty to say about uh, their contributions and about their experience of the Detection Club and about the craft of writing in general. But I thought that first I would start by uh, saying just a little about the uh, project and how this book came to be. The Detection Club, uh, as Barbara says, has, has an illustrious history, dates back to 1930. So this year is celebrating its 90th birthday. The celebrations, of course, have not been quite as um, uh, vociferous or as exciting as we'd uh, anticipated, for reasons that everyone will understand, but uh, there's always another day, there's always another year, uh, and there's always another Detection Club uh, get together and Detection Club dinner. and. Um, I was interested as, as president in the idea of uh, producing a book that would celebrate that, uh, uh, that rather splendid and special anniversary. And I had the idea of um, uh, producing a book that was a little bit different from the early Detection Club publications. Over the years, the Detection Club has produced uh, quite a number of books. Uh, the first, uh, as early as 1931, when uh, G.K. Chesterton, the very first president of the Detection Club, uh, and Dorothy L. Sayers, and Agatha Christie, Anthony Barker and others, collaborated in a novel called The Floating Admiral, which is still in print today, quite, uh, quite something. It's still in print in various uh, different languages as well. And that was so successful that uh, it led to quite a number of other books being produced in the 1930s. And the books have come out intermittently uh, since then, uh, really to shore up the club's finances because it's a, it's a small dining club, it's uh, uh, a not-for-profit uh, organisation, of course, funded by uh, member subscriptions and, uh, and by the uh, proceeds, the royalties of, of the books that we produce. So it was high time that we, we brought out another uh, volume. And so uh, I, I pitched to the members the idea of a book about the art and craft of writing detective fiction, because who better than the uh, members of the Detection Club to, to produce such a book? And uh, uh, I envisaged that perhaps 15, 20 uh, uh, members might be uh, persuaded or have their arms twisted to, uh, to contribute, and that, that would uh, make up a book. And it, it would be uh, not just how done it, but how we did it. It, it, it would be an insight into uh, uh, into different writing styles, different methods, uh, different approaches to all the different aspects of uh, writing crime. Uh, and I thought we'd also include a number of pieces by 
former members, deceased members, uh, uh, including Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers, to, uh, to show that um, things have changed in crime fiction, but some of them haven't changed quite as much as you might imagine. Well, um, I was delighted that the members were, were enthusiastic about the idea, and we pitched it to Harper Collins, who published a number of uh, Detection Club books over the years, uh, and we decided to call it How Done It. And so I started um, that arm twisting process. And um, to my surprise and delight, the members were, were not only willing to have their arms twisted, they, they came up with some absolutely fantastic material. And more and more manuscripts came in, more and more arms were twisted, more and more uh, emails were sent out. And in the end, almost every living member of the club, including uh, a number who've uh, uh, not written for a good many years, uh, contributed uh, over 60 people with a total of over of 90 contributors plus myself as, as editor, uh, covering all aspects of the uh, uh, craft of crime writing. Uh, and um, we decided to dedicate the book to Len Dayton, the wonderful uh, Len, who's uh, uh, not published a, a new novel for quite a long time, but has been a member of the Detection Club for 50 years, think about that, 50 years, uh, a member of this club. And he was uh, excited by the idea and he has contributed a wonderful essay, which is the, the very last thing in the book, which is all about his own career as a crime writer. He's also contributed some uh, uh, wonderful items from his own personal library, photographs, uh, uh, photographs of his uh, uh, working methods and, and also the dinner that he attended with uh, Ian Fleming, of course, the creator of James Bond. So one of the uh, uh, rules I set for myself when editing this book was uh, to edit with a very, very light touch. And I was conscious that authors would all have their own individual voices. I wanted those voices to be heard. There were bound to be differences of view. And of course, one of the great differences in, uh, in crime writing is, is the divide between those who plot a novel uh, and those who fly by the seat of their pants. And uh, we have both perspectives uh, uh, in How Done It, uh, different authors explaining how they go about it. Uh, Kate Ellis uh, has, has written a wonderful piece uh, illustrated by one of her flowcharts as to how she plans so meticulously her, her wonderful novels. But there is also a piece by Andrew Taylor, which deals with uh, his own approach to uh, writing a crime novel. And I wonder, Andrew, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about that, please. Um, it's not really an approach. It's more, more really a series of blunderings. Um, it, when I came to write my first novel, I, I was trying to write my first novel for years and years, literally about five years. And I just couldn't, not, my big stumbling block was I couldn't plan it. I just couldn't somehow, I didn't have the sort of brain that could sit down and think, well, okay, in chapter one, this will happen, chapter two, that will happen, and so on to the end. Um, I knew it to be a crime novel, and I knew, you know, certain things, that, certain themes interested me, um, but I had no idea of the storyline, and I, I, had a, I had a moment of truth. I was working in a public library at the time, and one February lunchtime, um, it was raining, I was very depressed, and I had this feeling if I didn't actually start writing a novel, wherever it went, at that very moment, I'd never write a novel at all. And I just picked up a biro and a sheet of A4, and I, I wrote right through my lunchtime. I wrote seven pages, which eventually became the first seven pages of my first novel, Caroline Minuscule. And at that, during that lunchtime, I made the miraculous a discovery that each sentence has the germ of the next sentence within it, and so on, and so on. The third sentence has the germ of the fourth. Then you have a paragraph, ooh, and then you can move on to the next paragraph. It all has an internal logic that once you tap into that, you can just follow it where it goes. Now, obviously, as I went through that first novel, I learned you have to sort of somehow touch the current this way or that and direct it. But 
always the important thing is to keep that forward motion. Um, I was I was listening to David Mitchell, the novelist, on the on the radio yesterday, and he said, "The one the one the, the best advice you can give a first time novelist is to get to the end of a book, because once you've got a whole book." You can apply a completely different part of your mind to it. You can use the analytical part of your mind because you've got the whole thing there. You can see which part you need to tweak. But what I discovered with that first novel was that you don't have to use the analytical part. You shouldn't, well, in my case, you shouldn't use the analytical part until you finish the thing. It comes afterwards. As Reginald Hill, that the late, great, wonderful Reginald Hill once said, the plot is something I put in afterwards. And when he said that, I just cheered. I mean, this is exactly my approach. You, you get the book out there and then you put the plot in. God bless Reginald Hill, that's what I think. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, now, now, Ellie, um, you, you talk in the book about something different. We'll, we'll come on to that a bit later. But um, I, I wonder how, how you approach the, uh, the, the uh, project of, of writing your own wonderful novels. Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm so sorry about my cat. That's what happened. He was meowing outside, I had to let him in, then he stood on the keyboard and he's he's just there at the moment. But anyhow, if he if the screen goes black, it's not me. It's because he's a black cat and he stands in front of the screen. So um so yeah, my first my first tip is don't have a cat. No, do have a cat. Um, but don't kill the cat. I think we can all agree on that. That's the one thing a crime novelist should never do. Um, so interesting to hear you talk, Andrew, and to read your um to read your piece in How Done It, which is sort of about how to change the murderer, isn't it? Sort of, um, which I was so, kind of surprised to read Agatha Christie did sometimes, and I read her notebooks that sometimes she would change who did it halfway through the book, which just think, oh, who's the most unlikely? Which, which is really, as Andrew described it then, was quite freeing because you thought, oh, well, if she did that, I guess I'm halfway between. Um, Martin, your, your description of being a planner. Sometimes people say plan or pantser, don't they? Someone who flies by the seat of their pants or someone who plans. And I guess I'm kind of halfway through in that I usually do do a kind of, um, like a, a, just a chapter outline, a few pages for a few lines for each chapter. Um, and then as I go through the book, um, I, I do change it, you know, as I go along and it's a bit like having a map, but it's not a sat nav. So it's just a map so you can go off and you can detour. And there's that wonderful quotation, Andrew, in your piece. And who said it? They said, writing books like driving at night, you can only see as far as your headlights go, but you can finish your journey like that. Who said that, Andrew? That was E.L. Doctorow. Oh, it was E.L. Doctorow. And you quote it in your piece. And that's, I, I think that's... <laughs> You, you attributed it, that's fine. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's something to, to remember really. And now when I write, I don't do a written plan at all. I just try and keep it in my head and try when I finish each chapter to write a little bit of the next one so I know what's gonna happen. So I try, I suppose, to sort of have faith in it. And just to follow on from, from um, David Mitchell's advice, as somebody said to me very early on that you can fix a bad page, but you can't fix a blank page. So just get it all down there. <laughs> Wise words. Uh, how about you, Aline? Uh, what's your approach? Well, it's it's interesting that you you picked up on the, the, the Andrew's Andrew's point about changing the murderer, because I did actually write a book and get to the third, what I thought was going to be the third last chapter, and I suddenly thought, but he didn't do it, <laughs> and. I, I, I suddenly thought, of course he didn't do it. It was, it was the other one. And um, I, it all just seemed fine. And I thought, no, no, I've got to go back and bring that murderer more into focus. But when I started reading it, I realised it was all there. It was, it was actually quite complete. And one half of my brain had been working one way and the other half had been working the other way. And... Once I changed the murderer, that was fine. It's never happened to me again. <laughs> and, uh, but I started writing because it was just the most natural thing in the world. I, I completed my first novel at the age of six, um, which was the story of uh, 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 two elf persons who went off to Paris together for the weekend. 
and they were called Mr. Wiz and Mrs. Woz. And I, you know, I didn't actually disclose what Mr. Woz and Miss, Mrs. Wiz thought was going on. But um, I should really have gone on writing Bogbusters, I think. But my mother laughed so much. She laughed and tears ran down her cheeks, which rather put me off the idea. So after that, I took to crying. I mean, that's all you can really do. So it, it, it took me a certain amount of time to work out how to get it published. I have a, an unrivaled, I would have an unrivaled uh, set of rejection slips if I'd been wise enough to keep them. I could have sort of paid in the bathroom. Um, but the thing was, it I didn't realise it was supposed to be so difficult. And in the days when I started doing it, there weren't all these courses and how to's or the rest of it. I just wrote and I got a book published. I, I realized afterwards it wasn't a brilliant book and I never let them reprint it. But once I realized how to it just how to get through it, that was fine. And it was only later I realized that there were all these things you were supposed to look for like a narrative arc. Now, I wrote several books before I'd even heard of a narrative arc. Um, and, and, you know, where you have where you have to, this climax here, climax there, all the rest of it. Um, and the, the, the remarkable thing was, afterwards, when I did know all these things I was supposed to do, I find actually they happened anyway. And I, I said, I think in, in How Done It, I said it was like um, the bourgeois gentilhomme when he, he was very, he wanted to be very sophisticated. Um, and he was thrilled when he discovered that when he'd been talking, he was actually talking prose. And he didn't know it was prose. And I felt very much like that. I was terribly chuffed when I found that. But Andrew, the other thing he said, um, which absolutely chimed with me. I say this all the time, every time I get into a mess with the book, I say, trust the story. And I don't usually know exactly where it's going, because if I did, I'd get bored. I have to tell myself the story. And um, it's that's what draws me on. Sometimes I've not had much idea how it will end. Mostly I think I know, but it, it isn't always obliging. But just pants on seats. Um, you can't write a verse. I think it was Ruth Dudley Edwards who said, you know, you can't be a crime writer unless you write a crime novel. Just sit down and get on with it. And I have to say, when a writer, a new writer says, what advice do you have? I will say, apply a seat of pants to a seat of chair. I remember right. hearing Frank Cottrell Boyce talking, you know, the, the scriptwriter, and he said, no one comes out of a film saying, what a great narrative arc. <laughs> <laughs> he always come out saying, wasn't that amazing, that scene at the theatre or the scene with the parents? You remember the scene, so I try and tell myself that sometimes. Well, so, I think, I, oh, may I? Um, myself, I think a very useful tip if you're trying to write a crime novel is you simply start with the body. I mean, it's it's so blindingly simple, but once you've got a body in your first paragraph, and I've done this, I did this with my first novel, once you've got a body there, you, you've got a story. Because obviously you have to know who whose is the body? How did it die? Was it murder? If so, who did it? You know, it, the, the questions spiral out from that simple fact of a corpse on the carpet. And you can you can go anywhere with it. So I recommend a body. Sorry, Milton, I interrupted. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, I, I think that um, in terms of uh, uh, books about writing uh, uh, crime fiction, I've, I've got a whole stack of them. Uh, I've not read all of them, but, but I've, uh, I've, I've certainly acquired a lot of them over the years. And um, uh, I, I've always thought that, that one of the difficulties with, with some of those books, there's some very good ones, some... Uh, and indeed one or two by uh, Harry Keating, for instance, uh, former president of the Detection Club, I, I quote, that's the one writing crime yes, fiction. I, actually, I 
I, I, I quote in, in How Done It uh, several times. That's, that's a very good, pithy, uh, and very, very wise, uh, mm. as you'd expect with such a fine writer, very wise guide. But, um, but of course, the difficulty with these single author books is that it, it's essentially one point of view. And, and for me, the joy of, certainly of reading the manuscripts as they came in was to see all the different approaches taken taken by my friends and colleagues in the club some of them diametrically opposed uh, uh we've spoken about plot but it in all kinds of other ways uh, and it's it's this contradiction that um that i think is part of the appeal because because th there is no one right way uh for writing a crime story but it's a question of what's right for the individual and i think that's one of the points that comes across very clearly and uh, uh, that contrast in in ideas is uh, is I, I think something that that when people read the book, people who are wanting to write a crime novel or maybe want to do more work, have have written one or two, uh, I, I think they'll gain a lot of encouragement and, and enthusiasm from that. I also hope the book will be of interest to people who've got no desire to write uh, crime fiction, but are just interested in in how some of their favourite authors. Uh, go about it. There's there's a whole range of things. There's correspondence between um, Dorothy L. Sayers and a scientist with whom she wrote one novel, her only novel not featuring Lord Peter Wimsey. And to me that's a fascinating account of the uh, the roller coaster of emotions that uh, many writers experience when they're actually writing the book. And sometimes it's going well and sometimes you feel it's never gonna be publishable um and it, it's a it's a question of viewpoint which brings me to the question of viewpoint in in narrative and that's something that you've talked about Aline. and i wonder if you'd like to say uh, a little about your approach to uh, the different possibilities that viewpoint offers to a writer i i do use several viewpoints in, in any book i choose in when i go into a scene which person I'm going to be looking through. Um, it's, again, it's something you, you, you realize afterwards. You need to be quite careful about it because one of my, the first, first lecture I ever went to from a, an author teaching you how to write, um, she talked about the fact that if you've got two people in a room, if you don't stay with one and see everything through their eyes, it ends up a little bit like a tennis match, as the conversation bounces from one person's mind to another person's mind. Um, and the, the scene immediately coalesces once you've worked out who are you, who are you looking through. Um, but then, of course, there are all sorts of things that you have to take account of because you're looking through that person's eyes, they may not know what is going on in the other person's head. So they have to work out from a gesture, um, an expression, reading between the lines. The other thing you can't do is take your viewpoint character and describe them as if they were being seen from the outside. Um, she was looking upset, but you can't say that if the story is going through that one person. So there are all sorts of little pitfalls like that, which, which, is, which is quite interesting. Something that if you are writing that, looking through it afterwards is, is going to be helpful to think, now, is that working? Um, so from that point of view, uh, that's, that's how I set it up. Um, I also find you have to have a limited number of viewpoint characters. They have to be fairly prominent in the book. You can't just switch every time there's a, there's a different person and scene. Um, but the great thing is you then do get behind the character. And one of the, one of the really funny things that happens, you know, as one of the other writers, I can't actually remember offhand who it was, said it, it, it sounds a bit woo-woo to say that the characters have a mind of their own. But when you have a familiar viewpoint character, the great thing is when you sit down, you're not sure what they're going to say. I mean, I have one character in my, my first series, uh, the Marjorie Fleming series, um, Tam McNee, who's a wee Glaswegian 
um, policeman. And when I would sit down to write something from Tam's point of view, I feel quite excited now. I wonder what Tam's going to say today. And he obliged. It, it's a, it is an odd thing. And I was fascinated to find that there are other people talking about that too, when the character takes over. Yes, yes, thanks, thanks. And, and Ellie, what about you? What, what's your uh, approach on the question of viewpoint? I really enjoyed your um, chapter, Aileen, and uh, so interesting uh, because I teach creative writing, as I I'm, think we probably all do, and it's something that my students really struggle with, is point of view. And, and I often say to them, where's the camera? Your analogy of the head going to and fro, like in a, a tennis match, you know, where's the camera? And they, they often have quite a lot of trouble in, in realizing where it is and who's talking, whether you are in the close point of view or whether you are having a, a bit of an attack of the omnis omniscient narrator, which as you do say, is probably better avoided most of the time. I mean, you know, it can work. And I do remember recently, somebody did a really nice piece of writing for me. And they said, um, I blushed. And I said to them, well, what's wrong with that? And, and she couldn't really see it. Um, but of course, the thing is, that's not something you can say about yourself. You can say, I felt myself getting hot. Um, I was worried that I was going red. Oh, I hope I'm not blushing. You could have all those feelings, but you can never say authoritatively, I blushed because you're not looking. And, um, you know, you don't want to resort to, I mean, we've all read the sort of usually quite terrible bits of writing that involve the point of view person looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, mm, yeah. usually, yeah, it's been unfair to say this, but it's often a male writer writing a female who looks at themselves in the mirror rather a lot. Um, and then rather... <laughs> I'm not going to say further, but in a rather sort of gloating way. So I think point of view is really important. And I know for myself and my own work, you know, what works best for me is you when I'm when I'm stuck, what works best for me is thinking right into that character's point of view. You know, when I'm writing about Ruth, the, the protagonist of my sort of longest series, what can Ruth see? What at this moment, what what you know, what is Ruth looking at? And that always, always helps. So yeah, really fascinating chapter. Thank you. Well, I, I, I certainly find if a, a scene is really sticky, it's nearly always because you've got the wrong viewpoint character. And very often, if you've been that, it just it flows. Yeah. I, find, I find sometimes that, that the, 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 one of the most crucial choices I have to make when I'm beginning to write a book is that one of viewpoint that, that it's it's often very hard to get right first off with in, in my case anyway I'll, I'll begin writing the first person thinking, no that's not, that's not going to work it'll have to be third person and I and it there's so many variants you have to try to find the one that feels right for this particular story it's a it, it's a big choice isn't it what what the viewpoint is going to be and yes. Can I say something just for a sec? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this. David Morrell, you know, broke into crime writing with Rambo, but has actually written many, many things since. It was called First Blood. He and I were sitting in his writer's studio in Santa Fe, and he was really struggling with point of view and character. And um, some hours later, he came back to me and he said, you know, I've solved it. And I said, wonderful. What did you do? And he said, I renamed him. <laughs> and just the simple act of renaming the character made a complete difference. And I think it's interesting to think about the freight that we assign to names. You know, maybe it's a person we knew, you know, Bruce is not one of my favorite names and I have no idea why. Maybe I knew some jerk called Bruce years ago. <laughs> I really don't know, but there's emotional content to names. And um, for David, just the simple act of renaming this character freed him up to, to um, you know, change him and, and offer a different point of view than when he had the other name. So I've always really thought that was a tip that deserves more prominence than it gets. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm just going to say, I think names are really important for, for a crime writer as well. And I think, Martin, you quote uh, H.R.F. Keating might have had something to say about this as he had about a lot of things in that, you know, it's not cheating if as a crime writer, writer you always describe a lovely person called Andrew and um, the reader Why not? 
<laughs> it is a lovely name, Andrew. My husband is also called Andrew, a lovely name. But then they might not associate lovely, suave Andrew with the rather creepy Uncle Andy in the first chapter. And you're not cheating, you know? You just, And it's always a clue as well, isn't it? When somebody calls somebody by a different name. So my husband's nearly always called Andy, but I call him Ollie for a long reason. But you know, that shows intimacy, doesn't it? A different, so I think you're absolutely right, Barbara. Names are very important. Oh, I wish it were I that were that intelligent. It was actually David Merrill, but um, I give you credit. The other thing too, that I find as a reader, I'm, I can contribute to this conversation a little bit as a reader and a bookseller is that it's always a mistake to have similar names in a book. If you've got Jack and John and Jim in one book, the reader is really distracted by that. And I found in books I've edited, I've had to think about that. A lot. But I also wanted to offer a comment by an author named Robert Eversos, who I think is a brilliant writer. I wish he'd had a longer publishing career. And to be honest, I don't know why he isn't continuing to publish, but somehow he vanished from my universe. But I think this is so true. He said to me, and I repeat it often, that every book exists in three forms. The first one is the one that the author intends to write. It's the book in the author's head. It's the perfect book. Um, and then the second one is the book that the actual that actually publishes the one that the author ended up writing, which doesn't necessarily, in fact, almost never can perfectly match that ideal um, book that the author intended to write. But the third form, and this one I talk about with my customers a lot, is the book that each person reads because every single reader brings his or her own experience, his or her own agenda, prejudices. I'm telling you, when you do a lot of these Zoom events and you've got a comment field or a chat field, you could hardly believe some of the comments that go by. Um, I mean, when I was talking to Michael Connolly Tuesday night, some guy leapt in and said, well, this book's written in first person, so I'll never read it. And I thought, okay. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's fascinating to talk, to have customers at an event or to run a book club or something and recognize that the book that I read is not really the book everybody's talking about because each person has personalized and internalized that book. And I think as an author, you have to recognize that, um, that, you know, and, and often authors are surprised at questions and they, I see them look at me and they go, did I actually write that? Or, you know, it's just astounded that somebody interpreted it um, in a way that, that they didn't imagine. So, you know, I, I think every author has to be true to whatever that original platonic vision of the book was and not get yourself all worked up about reviews or comments from readers or other things because there's really no logic to it. It's, it's experiential, or at least I think so. After yeah, 25 uh, years, I don't think I'm going to be surprised that then every once in a while, all over again. I, I think it is, it, it, it's absolutely right that, that readers bring their own perceptions. And uh, I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Gallows Thought. I've had readers saying, oh, the Me Too movement and, and the, the pandemic. Yeah, I wrote the book <laughs> before I knew anything about Me Too or the pandemic, and it's set in 1930 anyway. So, so it's 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 quite a surprise when when people see these things that, that the author didn't intend. But of course, it happens all the time uh, in different ways, and and we do it ourselves as readers with, with books that we uh, uh, we find fascinating. Uh, and this uh, this question of perspective is not just about the perspective of Patsy. It's, it's about the perspective of the readers too. Um, in the Dorothy L. Sayers chapter in How Done It, the book that um, she discusses in correspondence, it's, it's a series of ex extracts from letters, is, is a book called The Document in the Case. And she explains how she, she draws from the experience of Wilkie Collins writing The Woman in White and The Moonstone in having the different viewpoints. So she does it in the form of documents rather than uh, uh, separate chapters, but again, it's the idea of uh, utilizing a, a particular approach to uh, viewpoint and, and doing so with um, with quite a lot of the imagination. Now, now the author's life is is really full of, of so many of these unexpected developments. Whether it's what a reader thinks uh, about your book, good or bad, or, or anything else, and and one of the things um, 
we wanted to do with Cow Dummett was, was not just to talk about the nuts and bolts of the craft of writing, but also to talk about the, the writer's life and all kinds of variations. So there's uh, material about the short story, radio scripts, how to please an editor, great chapter by uh, uh, Antonio Hodgson, uh, and so on. And th there are also sections dealing with um, the problems that, that writers encounter. Uh, because uh, the writing life is not entirely straightforward all the time, as we all know. Uh, it comes as a surprise to some readers, but it's a fact. And so um, members of the Deception Club have talked about their experiences, the ups and downs, the, the issue of writer's block. Is there such a thing? And if so, how do you deal with it? Can you use um, improvisation techniques to get over some of the uh, plot problems we've been talking about? Stella Duffy. Uh, writes a great chapter on, on that subject. Mark Billingham uh, recalls his experience as a stand-up comedian and draws a parallel between what, what the writer does and what a stand-up comic does in terms of uh, timing of, uh, of a revelation or a punchline, that sort of thing. And, uh, and again, reading all these manuscripts, I, I, I was absolutely gripped, as I'm sure readers of, of the book will be. And we don't neglect either the, the practical side of things and of course um, uh, like it all over one of the practical sides of um, being a, a commercially published author is is marketing um, uh, you know it's it's a very important thing it's it's all very well to write a book but it also needs to be sold and and ellie you 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 contributed to how done it a fantastic chapter on uh, social media uh, among other sort of things. I wonder if you tell us a little bit about your uh, your approach and your experiences and your your feelings on that uh, uh, topical subject. I have to say my children laughed themselves stupid when they heard that I was writing about social media but I think <laughs> it, it you know I absolutely was not writing just because I call it the interweb doesn't mean I don't know what it is um you know I, I actually <laughs> wasn't writing from the position of uh, an expert, but as an, a writer who just isn't an expert, but just wants to do the best for their book. And, you know, I was thinking, well, nowadays you can't just write a book. Um, you have to promote it and you have to really put yourself out there. But then when I started to think about it, I thought this isn't new. Um, and of course, Charles Dickens did these amazing lecture tours um, and it was, in fact, an over-enthusiastic rendering of the death of Nancy that, that reputedly killed him. So he was actually killed by promoting his book. And that's why my chapter is called Social Media and the Death of Nancy. Um, so I did want to look, look at it. You know, you've written the book. What can you do? In some ways, what is the easiest path, you know, to... to um, to promoting your book, that the minimum that we can do, you know, put something on, on Facebook, put something on Twitter, put a nice picture on Instagram. And I do it in the book, uh, and it's probably fitting that my cat has interrupted so many times, that black tail you keep seeing coming to and fro, because I've said get a cat or get an animal, because people will like to see your book, but to be honest with you, they will so much prefer to see your cat or your cat with your book. Or, or any cat, you know, or any dog. So just get an animal, sit it next to your book and people love it. People love to see you, but the, I'm sorry to say they prefer to see your animal. Um, but, and there are some quite funny stories in the chapter and one, which is one that Simon Brett told me, which, uh, you know, we've, we all go out there, you know, promoting our book and we hope to see a room full of smiling faces. And one of the things about Zoom is we can't see the people who are out there, but we just hope they are out there. Hello, everyone. Um, but Sam Brett was telling a story about an author who was on um, a tour, I think a, a, a foreign tour, um, an embassy, British embassy tour. And he got to the place and there was only one person there. And he said to the guy, look, there's only you and me. Why don't we just go to the pub and, and you can ask me anything you want to ask me. And the man said, no, you must do your talk. And the, the author realized that this guy had been employed to play the piano in the interval. <laughs> he had to do the talk just for the pianist. So, you know, we've all done these things. We've all done things we've gone and there'd just been one or two people there. But I suppose my chapter is a little bit about the, the, what you can do and just the basics of doing it. I've said, you know, go on Twitter or Facebook and don't talk about your book. Try and talk about your friends' books because then it will make you look like a lovely person, as I'm sure you all are. But the nice thing is 
then your friends will talk about your book and it's just a bit more interesting. So it really is just the basics, how to promote your book without killing yourself doing uh, an over-enthusiastic rendition of someone's death. <laughs> Aline, um, how about you? How, how do you uh, feel about marketing your own books? I'm, I'm a hopeless marketer. I, I like talking to people and I, you know, I've done a lot of that one way or another, but I'm, I'm, I'm not good at going to someone and saying, you know, this is this fantastic book I've written. I can't do it. You know, I was always taught you don't boast about what you've done. <laughs> I think that's a terrible handicap. I always think that the people who are really, really pushy get on much, much better. And I know that. And networking, I don't understand. I go to a party and I find somebody who's really interesting. And I should talk to them for about five minutes um, and then move on to find somebody else. And I never do. I, I tend to sort of go on in the conversation because it's interesting with the result that I leave having met three people um, as opposed to the 25 I ought to have met for the purposes of, of, of promotion. But, um, it, but the, the talks, as long as there is somebody um, sitting there, you feel you have to do something about it. And my great consolation was once being in um, Waterstones in Piccadilly. And Penny Vincenti, who at that time was at the top of all bestseller lists, was sitting there alone with piles of books. And I thought, oh, well happen to her it's not so bad when there's a small audience for me but I love libraries I do really love library talks the, the, the people in libraries are always lovely and great fun and and you can really get a very personal relationship with them whereas you can't with a, a huge audience um, but um, I'm certainly not good at promotion I've been forced rather reluctantly onto it have you got a cat Sorry? Have you got a cat? I don't have a cat. I used to have a Dalmatian. Now, oh. if I'd been able oh. to bring my Dalmatian, yes. that would have been simply wonderful. But alas, that was a good while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, how about you? Uh, uh, what's your uh, uh, approach to marketing? Or is it something you think about much? Um, yeah, I suppose increasingly. I mean, I think. When I started, you know, my first novel came out in 1982 and marketing was a dirty word then. You know, publishing was still um, more or less in the sort of late 19th century in many ways. And authors were not expected to go out and sell themselves, certainly not in the UK anyway. Um, but gradually, I, even, even with my sort of slow slow intelligence, I, I realized I had to do this sort of stuff. And so I began to do libraries and bookshops and so on. And then along came, then along came the interweb, as you call it. Um, and indeed, I call it too sometimes, um, which, which opened things up quite a lot, doesn't it? Twitter and Facebook, Instagram even, mean you can connect on some sort of level with an awful lot of people right across the world. And I really, really like that. I find I've got, I, I fairly soon got to the point where I realized that for me, I just can't do the, the direct sell. You know, here's my book, buy it and I'll love you forever. That sort of thing. I can't do that. It, I don't think it works very well. And I think this may be a cultural thing. Um, but what I can do is I can talk to people. I like talking to people. And I, a writer's life, as we, as we all know, has its, has its solitudes. And it's, it's lovely to get out there and talk to people. I really, really enjoy that. And one of the, one of the great joys of a, a live audience is when it, start bouncing, when it starts bouncing back at you and you, you realize you're, you're not just talking to people, you're in a conversation. Um, yeah. And it, yes, it's, it's, it's great actually, I really like that. And even, even on Twitter sometimes you connect with people and you end up having a conversation with something quite bizarre. Um, it's got nothing to do with your book, but hey, it's fun. And I like to think that, that if you don't sort of ram home your marketing message too much, it's actually a more effective way of selling yourself and your books. What you're selling, certainly on Twitter and Facebook, is almost you as a person, 
rather than your product. And once people begin to invest in a particular author, in the sense they can they can chat on on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, um, they begin to think, well, I'll read the book too. I'll buy the book because I know this person. It's it's it makes it personal. Um, but I think it's terribly hit and miss, and I think one should only do what you enjoy doing. I mean, the writer's life is such a weird thing anyway, but I, I, if I've learned one thing is that there's no point in doing things you don't enjoy. It just doesn't work out in the end. And in the end, and I do say that in the article, in, in the end, the only thing that, we, that only we can do is write the book. So yes. we do have to concentrate yes. on that. And I totally agree with you, with both of you, really. It's just more fun to actually have a conversation, isn't it? And I do love that when suddenly um, an event, like, like, like uh, Alina, I love going to libraries or bookshops, when an event suddenly becomes a chat. But you can sometimes have that on sort of Twitter or something. And I've got two words to say to you, Barbara, about Bruce. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> you know, his, his um, actual lead guitarist is one of my best customers. So I know. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Nils oh. Lofgren loves you. I wish I could but but let, I let me follow up what, what Andrew, what, what you were all talking about, you know, as writers, what really makes you distinctive and what bonds readers to you is voice. It doesn't really matter what the character is because the voice can change, but you know, to really enjoy a book, it's, it's about the voice. It's about the character speaking to the reader in such a way that a bond is formed. Um, I've just been through this talking to Lee Child and his brother, Andrew. Uh, we did the launch for the Sentinel and part of that conversation was Andrew trying to work out the, the Reacher voice and taking it over himself. But if you think about it, since I've been, I, we found our first video not long ago when we were cleaning out the back room of the poison pen and it was made in 1995 and it was with Phyllis James who had arrived at the store and the crowd was such an overflow that in desperation I got a local TV station to show up and video it so people um, outside could watch it, which was really upsetting to her. And I had to draft an affidavit in our back room that it would never be shown in her lifetime after this evening because she was still in her rain gear, poor woman. I mean, she never even got a chance to go to her hotel. But anyway, we've been doing it since 1995. So the only thing we've had to learn in the pandemic was Zoom, which is a much better tool, I have to say, than Skype and the other things that were available to us. But what we have learned over 31 years of talking to literally thousands of authors is that you, you must do it in your most natural voice. You just have to be you. And um, any artifice or any attempt to to try to be somebody else, to talk down to people, talk up to people as the case may be, um, is always wrong. And so um, I really never started out to become a facilitator of conversations. I started out to be a bookseller just for fun. Um, it's a not-for-profit bookstore and so it really is just for fun. But boy, have I learned that um, in order to do a good job selling a book, promoting a book, my job is to really help the authors bring the author's voice to the reader, sometimes through me, sometimes directly. And I think Zoom is an absolutely remarkable. Look at the way we're all together. We would never have been able to do this without this technology, right? We're all in different different places, different. I'm in America, you're in the UK, you're in different places in the UK. I've done events with, you know, Australian and uh, and other, you know, authors all around the world in just one one video. Um, the the artist Bart's been to explain time zones. Nobody can figure out time zones. I've actually had somebody the other day ask me if I would do a lunch for a UK author and could we do it at five so the author only had to stay up till 1 a.m. And I wrote back and said, there's no reason to punish the author like that. We'll just do it at noon. It doesn't matter, um, you know, in a virtual event. It really doesn't matter what time it is because it's really the after views. It's not the number of people watching it at the time. It's the number of people who will watch it overall that has that effect. And it's it's like you throw a ball out there and it, and it just bounces. You cannot control what happens when, when you do that. You know, how many people will pick it up and throw it to somebody else or refer it and all. So there's a whole exponential growth thing that goes on that you, we just marvel at it. We truly do. Um, 
I'm, I, I, we did an event not long ago, a book discussion follow up to a best selling author because he was so frustrated we couldn't talk about the end of his book during his launch because you know we would have been lynched for spoilers and so forth. So I said, let's just do one three months later and then we can talk about the whole book. And a man from New Zealand sent me an email and he said, I don't think I can stay up long enough to do this, but I want, I want my question asked. So please ask the author this question. And while we were talking, there were people from Bulgaria, there was somebody from Karachi, there was somebody from Perth, um, all fans of this author who writes international bestsellers, all coming together. So there's an entirely new world of promotion now available to us. And the question I'm always asked is, you know, are you going to keep any of this? Yeah. The answer okay. is we are. You know, we're going to, I hope we can go back to live events. There's nothing more fun than a whole room full of people talking to authors and, you know, the whole back and forth dynamic that Andrew is talking about. It's wonderful. But I think that we can do amazing things by keeping this technology as part of it. So you know, it, it's, it's been a tough slog and, and it's hard for people who resist it. So my advice to every author would be try to embrace this as best you can, because it really is a remarkable tool. Yeah, yeah, well. It's well, also fun. It's also fun, isn't it? I mean, it's, I'm meeting people. It's great. It's lovely. I, I've seen more of Ellie this way, I think, than I've ever seen via yeah, Zoom. We've, we've done a few events together, haven't we? Yes, yeah. We've been yeah. yeah, it really is. Andrew and I caught up not long ago after several years of not seeing each other. We did a different Zoom chat, and Ellie, I really wanted to do one with you because you have so many readers who have never had a chance to talk. Well, that, How many? This is what our fifth in the last couple of months. I'd I'd love that. Yeah, I really would. Yes, I, it's so much fun, isn't it? And it's it's sort of magical, isn't it? It's but here we all are. Indeed we are. So congratulations to all of you. I think this is a remarkable um, book that you all have put together. And Martin, I did want to ask you, in fact, I'd like to ask all of you as a final question. I mentioned that the Detection Club is a social club, but I know that Andrew anyway, and you Martin, certainly, also belong to the Crime Writers Association, which I do have belonged to since 1990. What is the difference between the Crime Writers Association and the Detection Club? Because we have a lot of customers who ask for that. Well, the, the essential difference is that the Crime Writers Association is a professional organization. So, um, so if, if you are eligible to join because you've, you've published a, uh, a crime book or, or done certain other things in the field, then then you apply to join and, and you become a member. And, and it's, a, it's a large and, and successful organisation. The Detection Club uh, is and has always been a small group that, that is essentially a social club, a dining club. Uh, and it, it began very small in, in 1930 with, with 20, 20 members or so and has remained quite a, quite a small group because, uh, because of its nature uh, as, a, as a small social group group but but it's a very cohesive one and, and that i think is the secret of its astonishing longevity and and i, I did want to say uh, uh particularly uh before we finish how grateful i am to everybody who's contributed uh, it, it's quite extraordinary when you look at the roster of contributors uh ellie andrew uh, Aline, but but all the others as well, Val McDermott and Rankin and Cleves, and then the uh, uh, the likes of, of um, Dayton, John McCarrick, uh, and, and many, many more. And they've all done it for free to help the Detection Club keep going. And that, that's uh, something I'm enormously grateful for. And the same is true of the, the states of the deceased authors, whether it's Agatha Christie or P.D. James, I mentioned Chris James earlier. She, uh, there's a piece by her about landscape in the book and, and the sales estate and so on. They've all done it to support the Detection Club and I'm, I'm really quite bowled over. Uh, the, the book, uh, as, as people have noticed, is, is quite a large volume. It's much larger than I envisaged at the time of uh, uh, pitching the idea, but uh, I'm absolutely thrilled with it. It's, uh, it's been a fascinating experience putting it together. Uh, everybody has come together in the collegiate way that, in my experience, crime writers always do. It's been, it's been quite wonderful. Uh, and, and I hope and I, I feel confident that uh, 
that the leaders who, who look at this book will, will find it equally satisfying and equally enjoyable. Now, it would be fair to say that the CWA is the place that you would look for more professional support in terms of um, publication or promotion or some such thing. And the Detection Club would be more for fellowship to sort of nourish you as a writer, nourish your inner life. Andrew, do you look at it that way? Since I, I've known you for so long and I know you belong to both. I think the um, the Crime Writers Association, I mean, it's, it's very much a sort of a group of working writers which anyone can join. It's open to everyone if, as Martin said, you've met certain criteria, usually, usually published a crime novel. Um, but the Detection Club is different. It's, I, I, it's very hard to explain. I mean, you, Barbara, you've been to some of the dinners, you know, you know the flavor. It's, it's deeply eccentric. Um, it's, it's invitation only. Um, in fact, it's, you know, members vote to have new members. You have to be clubbable. You haven't, you, you've got to be a good writer. You've got to be clubbable. Um, I like to think of it as a sort of house of lords of crime writing, whereas the, the CWA is merely the messy old house of commons. Um, you know, we're the, we're the creme de la creme, you could put it. Uh, well, you don't you speak need to for yourself on this, don't you? At a CWA meeting, that's for sure. I really, I, I, my vivid memory um, is the skull. And oh, yes, Simon, Simon and the Skull, which you would not run into at your ordinary CWA meeting, which I've been to too. And I need, Aileen, I need to say, I'm, I'm sorry, we've never met before. So I feel as though I've directed some comments that leave you out unfairly. And it's only because we just don't have any history together. So I do apologize. I have read all your books and sold all your books. Indeed, that would be the case for all of you here. Um, so that's been wonderful. I'm going to leave you with one final memory of my experience with the Detection Club. Some years ago, when Harry Keating was still alive, I spent a night um, having dinner at the Keatings and then was escorted up to the third floor bedroom where I was going to spend the night. And after I crawled into bed, I looked around me and realized I was actually there in the Detection Club library. And unable to resist that, I went to the shelves and pulled down a copy of Gaudi Night, autographed by Dorothy L. Sayers. And I sat up all night reading this wonderful book. And before I went down to breakfast, I, it was a real test. I thought to myself, I could just chuck it in my suitcase and walk out. <laughs> and I said to Harry, when I, when I left, I said to him, you know, it says a lot for your view of human nature that you haven't frisked me as I'm going out the door. <laughs> So um, that, that was a remarkable, remarkable evening. And um, I do think the Detection Club is very special. Clubable is really not an American word. It's a very British word and kind of a British concept, Andrew. But I think it's, I think it's a wonderful one. So um, thank you all for, for joining me today. Um, we will certainly do our best at the Poison Pen to sell loads of copies of how done it. Um, they should arrive, in fact, on Monday for Tuesday publication. And um, I wish you a success on all the goals that you set for yourself when you started this project. Martin, you have been truly remarkable since you retired. I have never known anybody that has worked as hard on behalf of all authors and yourself as you have. Um, and I want to congratulate you again as the winner of this year's Diamond Dagger, just a remarkable award. Um, and I hope for your sake that when it comes around next year that you will get to actually have a real live person. I hope they'll let you share it with a 2021 winner. Don't you think that would be fair, everybody? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we should all lobby for that, I think. Anyway, um, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Night.